Would have been about 2005. Put an ad in just an online forum back in New Zealand looking for a singer. I had started writing songs that I wanted to, to start playing and found Steve. Steve was living in a place called Waihee. I'm from a, a little town in New Zealand called Waihee, which is um, in the Bay of Plenty area. And the rest of the guys are from Auckland, and, and I'd been in bands throughout school, just like you know the, the other guy in town that plays guitar, and, and the, the, the other guy that plays drums, and who were just coincidentally best friends, and in what would seem a really creepy fashion today, but it answered an online ad for, for a singer wanted, and, um, and got my friend who had a van to drive me up to Auckland for the audition, and, and got the gig, and the next week I was pretty much planning to move to Auckland, and, and just kind of dropped my life and, and said, let's do it. We kind of had a few iterations at the start, like a few basic versions and, and trials and that, but we, the actual main lineup really started, I think around 2007, when uh, Brad joined the band um, and Steve took over guitar duties because we always had another guitarist and Steve was just always a vocalist. They lost their old drummer, I was in a different band, I'd recently left that band. Just kind of happened at the right time, I think. And they were just starting to get a bit of momentum. So I come on just as the first single was coming out. Um, which is a walk away. Since then, the only one had one change, and that's when we moved over here. And uh, Chris, our old bassist, opted to stay in New Zealand, and then um, Elliot came on board over here. Early 2014, I'd, I was looking for another band. So I'd been I'd been playing in bands in Brisbane since I was a teenager, maybe 13 or 14 years old or something like that. Um, just, just work, you know, working through numerous projects, nothing really took off, nothing was really immensely serious, I suppose. Um, and then the project I was working on at the time kind of disbanded for, you know, whatever reasons, everybody getting older, all that sort of stuff, and I was really keen on finding another band, so I probably spent about two or three months just looking for, you know, going through the classifieds and Gumtree and stuff like that, looking for a, a sort of local band that would I would gel with and that I, the, whose music I liked and who kind of had that similar sort of work ethic to me. Yeah. And um, I stumbled across a Gumtree ad for this band called These Four Walls that I'd never heard of, you know. And um, so I went on to their, they had some links there to their, their material that they had and I was just, I was fucking blown away. It was awesome. And, and it was exactly, the funny thing was, it was exact opposite of everything else I'd seen. So there was a whole bunch of ads in there. Um, and you know, they'd always read kind of similar to be like, must be ultra serious, you know, <laughs> must have own transport, must have professional level gear, must be ready to record an album and tour yeah. nationally immediately, you know, rah, rah. And then there's a link to their SoundCloud demos and it's some of the, mo the, the most trash rubbish you've ever heard in your life. Yeah, oh yeah, just something, just stuff like that. Anyway, and, but, but uh, I think Grey must have written that ad and it was the exact opposite. It was like, hey, we're a band, we're looking for a bass player. Um, um, it, it, here's a link to our stuff, you know, and it was, and I was just floored by how good it was. So, um, so I got a hold of Grey and then arranged, a, arranged a, you know, a couple of audition sessions, I suppose. Went down there and we had a really good jam that night. You know, they came in with this new idea that they'd been working on, and I sort of like just started jamming along with what I would do with it. And you can sort of feel that, like, I don't know, the, the the electricity just sort of kicked up that next notch in the room and I was like, okay, I'm in the right place at the right time here. So I think it was the next day or something like that, I got a text from Gray just saying, look, we think you're pretty cool, you know, you're interested in doing more. Maybe two weeks later and then my first show with them was opening for Dead Letter Circus. It's been about 12 years now um, that we've been going and 
Yeah, it's long actually. Say it, no, say it out loud. It's like it's like longer than I've been in most jobs. I mean, thankfully we all really like each other. That's a, that's got to be a big factor in it, you know? Because like I mean, we've got a pair of brothers in the band that bicker like brothers, yet we're still a thing, you know? And um, I think the fact that we've aligned ourselves with people that we can share a van with for eight hours and share a bed in a hostel with, you know, um, after a sweaty gig, um, it's yeah. I think that's kind of what's kept us going. Um, yeah, no, but I wouldn't have it any other way. It's funny now. I can't. I can't imagine not waking up and thinking, oh, "I've got practice tonight." You know, like it's yeah, it's weird. It was 2013 when we moved. We'd played over here two or three times at least before then. Um, done a couple of East Coast tours, yeah. We love New Zealand and New Zealand is home for us, absolutely. Um, but yeah, we just kind of got to a point where we're like, okay, let's, we, let's try something different, you know? And um, so yeah, we just made the call and, and literally just moved over. No one had a job, no one had a house. Uh, we, I mean, my wife and I, we had no savings. We just jumped on a plane and we're here. Um, and man, which now, like in retrospect, was very stupid, um, very stupid. We wanted to make the change because um, we felt we, we had plateaued in New Zealand and we got to a point where it was like, all right, but we weren't probably gonna get any further than that. I, I don't think we realized how difficult it was going to be. I think we'd, we'd kind of, we'd done so much in New Zealand and we'd kind of had a ceiling as to where we could go um, and still kind of grow because we, we wanted to do more and more. We wanted new experiences and that. We are playing the same route, touring the same route, playing the same venues, that sort of thing. So we um, made the jump over here and straight off the ground, quite a few challenges. You know, our bass player left and um, just trying to figure out how to start from scratch again because I think we'd grown quite comfortable like being able to call the venue, hey, we want a Friday night, cool, it's yours, you know, ready to go. And then people would turn up and then you come over here and we're absolutely nobody again. So it's, it was quite terrifying. I don't think we really thought about how that was gonna pan out. We recorded our second album, Living to Write the End, here at, at Loose Stones, just around the corner actually from here. And that was a big reason why we chose the Gold Coast um, is because we actually had people in the industry, I suppose, that we knew here, like Matt Bartlam, who's mixing this album, he produced and, and uh, worked insanely hard on the last album um, uh, but he, he was here and, uh, and and we knew some guys in the butterfly effect and we knew obviously Luke Palmer and, and a bunch of the guys in Dead Letter so at least we knew friends here and we knew other bands here from the time that we spent here doing the album uh, so that was a big reason that we chose here. It's quite bizarre how, how easy it is to to forget how, how much you have until you leave you know you leave it and all of a sudden like what am I gonna do tonight oh I've got no friends over here I don't know anyone over here so it was, it was good though, because it kind of forced us to get out and you know, we, everyone, when we first moved over here, everyone lived in my place and we'd go to gigs, we'd go meet other bands, that sort of thing. So we actually became quite proactive with it, um, probably more so than we were in Auckland because we knew what we were doing in Auckland. We had, you know, quite a comfortable life there. So getting in and actually seeing new bands, getting involved in the scene was kind of forced upon us because we had to do something to kind of, to get in. We've really um, been kind of slowly chipping away uh, and then probably for the last two years have we really started going guns blazing, um, working towards the new album and, and just working towards really sewing ourselves into the scene here. Um, but I think it was the right call for all of us because, you know, music aside, our lives are all great at the moment as well. You know, we're all really happy in, in relationships and jobs and all that kind of stuff. It's, um, it's been really good life move for everyone as well. We're a band brought up on albums and we just kind of, you know, we wanted more so we we did an EP. We put out a couple of new songs that we had funded ourselves like uh, Bravery and Over and Over and we got to a point where we thought, hey, we actually got enough songs for an album but um, just we don't have enough money. <laughs> we knew that we had to do something to find the rest of the money so we, we kind of undenied it and said, fuck it, we have to do it. If you want to get a really good product, you've got to spend the money on it, you know, and, and that means good producers, good equipment, good studios, you know, within, within reason. So um, we'd gotten to the point where we knew how much we needed 
to do the album and there's just no way we could have done it in, in a short time frame. Um, so that's where the idea of the crowdfunding came from. So by the time we did ask, we'd already recorded six of the songs ourselves, so we felt like we don't need to ask for that much. So we put a small target on, um, just enough to basically finish what we knew, put it out there, and, and obviously it, it kicked off and you know we hit our target within a couple of days, which we didn't see coming, but yeah, it was terrifying, because it's, it's the first time we've actually gone out and actually asked for money, you know, and that's the thing, because we've always, either through our own funding or we've been really lucky in New Zealand to have New Zealand and Air funding to do, get grants to do recordings and that, but this is the first time we've actually gone out to our audience and say, hey, help us out, you know, see if we can get some money, and it was fucking incredible. Yeah. It was something that was very terrifying. I was I was the hardest against it out of everyone. Like it was, I hate asking people for things in general. I'm just not that. I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, and uh, yeah, so so when it, particularly asking for money um, from our fans, you know, it was like oh. But um, but the response honestly, like it was it was so mind blowing and so heartfelt. Uh, when, when I woke up that first morning and saw like we were like a third of the way there, I just I, I was honestly struck. I, was, I just couldn't believe it. It was insane. Yeah, and, and the demographics were the most interesting thing because we've obviously got a fan base in New Zealand and we thought that was quite strong, but we weren't sure about Australia. But 80% of our funding came from Australia. So it was, it was really interesting to kind of see what kind of impact we've already had over here and how that affected the crowdfunding. Yeah. But on top of that, there's this crushing weight of accountability now because it's like you got shareholders, you know, when it was just us and we're putting our own money for it, we're making it for us and yeah. if don't, people don't like it, who cares? You know, we paid for it, who cares? But now it's like all these people have put all this money into it, like, this cannot suck. <laughs> We've got to do a good job. And it's, it's, I've had a few waves of just like, holy shit, holy shit, people are expecting something from us now. Yeah. And it's a new feeling, I've not had that before. Yeah. We are all blown away by how generous and how supportive all the fans were and our friends and everyone who wanted to chip in and help kick it along. And that kind of like, I guess that sort of amped up the um, the necessity to put in, really put in everything we had into it, you know? It's given us an element of independence, but it's also given us an element of communication and connection with our fans and the people that actually made the album happen uh, that we just haven't had before. And it's been awesome. Like, we're, yeah, it's been a real community vibe. We were so thankful that we got there like quickly and it took the pressure off. We didn't have to worry about it the rest of the time. and. We just kind of thought about, oh, now let's get on with it. We can actually do this. That's kind of how the crowdfunding came to be, um, was the fact that we were, we're poor musicians. <laughs> That's about it in a nutshell. <laughs>given us a core right so he'll 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 write a demo at home and he'll do some scratch drum tracks and he'll send it out and we'll have a listen and we like it and add to it or we don't like it and just don't reply it that the song ever existed and that that, that sounds harsh but that's exactly how it happens man that, that's chaos that was chaos uh, that was a track that i put out to, to deaf ears hey guys i've written the song crickets okay cool you know like it. i'm gonna rewrite it hey guys i've written the song <laughs> Crickets. Okay. Third time lucky. Hey guys, I've written this song. Oh, that's great. <laughs> like, oh, is that a new one? Like, no, you've heard this riff three times. <laughs> Even if it's the same idea that you, you know, it, it wasn't right then, but now it's right now because I've done this to it. And now we've reached this, we're, we're ready to receive this. Steve kind of does less. What he comes up with is like, they're absolute bangers. You know what I mean? Like so much of what he brings into the table, I listen to it the first time I get goosebumps and I go, that's the best thing I've ever fucking heard, man. We've got to do that, you know? So over the years, I started doing that as well. So Gray and I will basically start just, just building a, like a blueprint, right? So really, really bare boned, nothing to the song whatsoever. Uh, and then what will happen from there is that the song will get brought into the band room and that's kind of where it really gets fleshed out. Normally, Someone comes with about like half a song. <laughs> and then we, we start working on that and just figure out what's missing or you know what could change or what makes it. Sometimes it, they come up with a song, but it doesn't. It's not these for all song. Sometimes we come up with these songs and then we're into it at the time. And then we might take a, we might play them a couple of times at a show and then go, that wasn't actually, nah, we're not really vibing on that and then shelve it. What we'll normally do 
is, is road test a song before we even think about recording it. Um, if it doesn't work for us live, it doesn't work. Uh, and I think that's it in a nutshell. Like we, we're a live band, that's, we love playing gigs. That's just, that's us. So if a song isn't working on a stage, then it's not happening. I think we did one gig in Auckland in 2015. We played five new songs. Uh, I don't think any of them made the album. <laughs> and then it's like a mad, you know, before you go into the studio, it's like a mad panic to fucking, you know, either relearn what you did at the very start or like keep up with the changes that have gone in there, you know. Well, that's probably the first perfect take. Yeah. Of the record, like I could just throw that in the comp and be happy. Cool. Just try one with the tune. No. <laughs> hey, that was perfect. Now let's do another 10. Just in case you get sloppy. I told you to walk away story, right? No. We're doing our very first like radio single. Cool, well, let's just do a full take of the solo and then we'll do it in bits and cut it up. When we spent four and a half hours recording the solo, chopping it up and doing that, he's like, I just want to listen to the original as a reference, and like a perfect take. And that's that, that whole uncut solo is the one that appeared on the record. <laughs> Go. <laughs> that's why you never give anyone the chance to do it in one take. <laughs> Delete that first take. What, in case they get too uh, proud of themselves? Yeah. <laughs> Does it keep them in check? Keep them in check. Part of your job as a producer is psychological warfare. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this record started three years ago. Under, an, like, we had a working title called Meteor, and it was a concept record. It was a concept of Meteor's coming to Earth, seven days, it's gonna hit, nothing we can do about it, what do you do? And we kind of had the story that Steve and I have been working through, it's just like this guy who's going through redemption, he's going through the five stages of grief and, and just the general chaos in the world around them when the, when the meteor was coming. Um, and we got really into it, really excited, and then we worked ourselves into a box. Just, it didn't work. Like, we're, we're not obviously that band who can write a concert record with a storyline and a comic book and all that sort of shit. It just wasn't working for us. So we ripped the whole thing apart. Um, two songs survived, Fire Away was one of them, and there's another one, which I don't think we've actually given a name yet, we're going by the title Arcade, um, but that, that was another one from that, that session, but everything else is wiped. And we didn't try to force it or, you know, we just had to kind of keep going until we felt like we had enough songs, probably like 20, um, to start with, but that we could whittle down. I call what we're doing is working, we know it's working, so we've got to keep on this trajectory, and then all the stuff that, was, that wasn't in that trajectory just got thrown out. And, Putting this album together over such a long period of time, you know, we went through a long time where we just couldn't quite put our finger on what the sound would be. We wrote Far Away Bravery and over and over, and then went to the studio and recorded them, and then we heard Bravery like once it had been finished, we're like, yeah, okay, that's that's the kind of starting point. And then the way that I think Bravery was received, and that was a huge boost for us over here that then changed where we are going with other songs. So again, more songs got scrapped. And I think we went through about 150 different songs between the start of the Meteor Project to the end of this. At least bits of songs and, and blueprints and that. Like, not just like, here's one single riff of a guitar. It's like drums, vocals, bass. We actually really worked on a lot of different pieces. And, and ultimately, it just boiled down to what's worked. You have a whole practice and just nothing yeah. happens and you just feel real bummed out. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah and then the next one you might just in the first 10 minutes, just go, oh yeah, we got it. But yeah, there's a couple of tracks like that, like Silent Wars, another one, whereas this is a whole different song, yeah. and we're about two weeks out from tracking, and then Elliot's like, hey, why don't we try like this? And like, it went from this really slow, moody ballad to what it is now, yeah. and that's just because it was like, oh, I like the song, but what if you thought about if the Foo Fighters played it? Like, you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then, then within half an hour, we'd reshaped the entire song, but not changed a single part. We just played it differently. Like, oh, cool. And then now the song, which wasn't even a contender, is now on the record. Just, yeah, it's fascinating how that happens. I think we've all gotten better at our instruments over the years. Um, so I think technically this is this is the most advanced album that we've done. Um, there's some there's some really really cool things that we've never ever tried before. Um, there's a lot more production in this album that we haven't tried before. Like Luke Palmer, uh, who is the producer, wanted to add a lot more layers to a lot of the songs, which includes things like drum machines and synthesizers and instruments that we don't play um, that really do add extra layers to the song. So there's a lot more of that um, that just add. It, I was always worried that it's just one of those things that we're not a rock band anymore, but it doesn't take away anything. It, it adds layers, if anything. We tried more, I think, with, and I don't mean like put more effort in. Well, we did. It's, oh man, it's a hard question to answer. We did, we, we tried really, really hard um, but we experimented more, I think, with this, uh, was, is the way to say it, is that we really, um, we wrote the song and then deconstructed it and then just said, how can we make this way better by adding ideas? And, and, and then we put it back together and it was a Frankenstein of something which turned out to be awesome. And then we showed it to Luke and he cut all the pieces out. But, um, but yeah, no, we, we, tried, we tried very, very hard. We never will put anything out that the four of us don't believe in, so. And I, that, that's all you can do, really. Like, we, if we please the four of ourselves with our songwriting and we're happy with it, then there'll be other people that are happy with it too. Uh, there might be, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, who knows how many, but at least if the four of us are happy with it, we can keep playing, because we might be playing these for another 10 years, you don't know. I feel like we've got a lot less to prove to ourselves as well. Like, I think with, with the earlier releases, we were very much, we're on this trajectory, this is what we're trying to do, this is who we are, blah, 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 and then, I think moving over here has a lot to do with it, where people don't really buy into that sort of attitude. They just want good music. So, cool, how do we create good music? We have to just lighten up a little bit. We have to go with whatever sounds good rather than what we think we need to do. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's just been a big change for us, especially in the last couple of years from a writing perspective anyway. Individually, everyone pushed themselves harder than, than we ever have, uh, which was a big factor of it because we wanted this album to be a step forward. Uh, we didn't want it to be just another These Four Walls album, you know? We wanted it to sound like us, but we wanted it to be an evolution. Uh, there's been long enough between that we should sound better, <laughs> you know? The main thing is we love playing live. So we just tried to bring that into the studio and I think what we all do live is what we kind of contribute to the record as well. So say we We've known Luke for a long time, um, but yeah, it was it, it was really nice this time around working with a guitarist uh, as a producer. I mean, he's got a mind, a producer's mind for sure. He hears the whole picture. Uh, but having we're a guitar band, you know, we're all about riffs and and heavy choruses and and lots of guitars. And having a guitarist behind the helm of how the songs go, he understood where we wanted it to go as well, which was which was awesome. Something I've heard Steve talk a lot about is that it's good to have a guitarist really deep in the mix with us with what we're doing, and someone who's actively creating as a guitarist as well. You know, he's got Dead Letter, he's got Jacob Lee, he's got um, Arroyo. I think I've now changed their name, but he's he's in a lot of different projects, so he's still very valid as a writer, and he's he's. He's very on the pulse of what's going on, so he, he'll throw so many ideas at us that we just never think about, and, and nine out of 10 will we'll at least entertain them, and, and half of them have made it on the record. So he, he's been a massive influence on, on us actually just changing a lot of our thinking about how things can go and, and what we can do with, with what, what we have. He thinks not exactly like us, like it's probably good because he gives a flavor that, that we wouldn't do, like we're probably a bit more meat and potatoes, and he's got, um, he's got a good ear for making things more interesting than what they originally are. Like any producer, you know, he, I think he's taken the songs to a place that's a little bit further than what we would have done and, and that's for the benefit of all the songs. It's the first time I've recorded vocals with anyone other than Matt 
recently. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was, he was super fun. It was just nice to throw ideas around and uh, yeah, and he's got an ear for harmony as well, which, which I really love. Like it's one of my favorite things to do is, is harmonize and uh, he's got a real ear for it. And he gave me some really awesome notes that I wouldn't have picked otherwise. And yeah, it was, it was cool just playing around. It was good. Well, he's super hands-on. Yeah. And that's what's really cool about it. It's like, um, if, I mean, you would have seen the instances where I'm, I'm trying to play something, he's like, oh, it's not quite right. And I can hand him the guitar and he can play what he's thinking, hand it back to me and I can record it or whatnot. Yeah. And it's like, that, that, that sort of um, sharing of ideas and like the solo, the, the end solo that we did for um, Rock Bottom was a good idea. It was him and I sitting in the room for a couple of hours just trading riffs and trading licks and that sort of thing. And we, we ended up piecing together the yeah. solo from a combination of our ideas. And it was like, I've never had that before. It's always been, I've got to have this thing perfect, then I've got to walk into the studio and record it, and that's it. Luke likes to snip a lot. Um, so like whenever there's a point, you can tell, right? So Luke, he'll be sitting there, he's listening, you hear his head go. And then all of a sudden the head will stop and then he'll just lean back and you know that the part's either too long or he doesn't like it. More often than not too long. So, cause we like, we like to extend parts out and have jams and things like that, but it's just for him, it just cut it up. Um, which was great because like he cut a lot of the fat out and, and if I'm absolutely honest, the, the songs that are on this album are way better because of it, way better. Like there's a song called Slow, which was gonna be like the lead single and, and we've been playing it live in its state forever. And we're like, it's done, dude. Like let's record it, it's finished. And he listened through it and he goes, the chorus sucks, the bridge is awesome, the bridge is the new chorus. And, and we're like, okay. And he was 100% right, like absolutely right. Just like snip, snip, done. You know, I was like, oh, okay, well that's how that song should go. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really good because again, fresh ears, um, but, but ears that kind of get where we're going, uh, which, was, which was great. Having Luke and Matt involved from a production and, and mixing perspective, um, is it, it, we've got a really good working relationship with them now, especially with Luke and there's a lot of honesty and like sometimes brutal honesty. It's like, cool, we, we like this riff. And it's like, well, cool, well, I'm bored to fuck. So <laughs> um, so, so having, having someone challenge us and I guess we've been around long enough to know when we're wrong and when we're right. You know, like when we're doing Downforce and Empire, you know, I was having screaming matches with our producer about, you know, let's, let's not have the drums in the first part of this song. Like, well, fuck you, this is where it goes. But now it's like, hey, we're gonna have a two and a half minute song that's just keys and synth. Oh, sorry, not even synth, it's keys and an actual fucking orchestra. Yeah. And there's no guitars for the first two minutes. All right, cool. <laughs> wow. So obviously, I think we've, we've just kind of gotten out of our way and, and learned to trust the people around us and the people that we're obviously, you know, we're bringing into the fold because we trust them a lot. So we, we've got to really carry that trust through and, and, and open the door for them to throw ideas out and throw our ideas out as well. We worked for probably a month or two on pre-production for these newest six songs. And yeah, some of the songs changed a bit. Nothing changed dramatically, but uh, yeah, just little textures. And obviously there's, there's some things that we ourselves are just kind of we like but we're not that much into like the programming side of things just getting some little samples and textures in there and so we just kind of went you know have at it fill up fill up those spaces we can kind of imagine what it would be like but we're not uh, as adept as he is at kind of doing that he's a very accomplished musician you know what i mean so he's like oh why don't you try this and I'll, I'll like try and play it and I'm like I don't know what the fuck you're talking about man or, or I can't play it so yeah. I give him the bass or the guitar and he goes like this and I'm like can you like yeah. slow yeah yeah can you like slow that down so I can see what you did you know black out something's coming loose your apathy is tightening the noose so hey yo systematic user this is not a future yeah, I reckon you'll be able to really punch that. That last line? Yeah, 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 yeah. Black out, something's coming loose. Your apathy is tightening the noose, so hey, yo, systematic user. I like someone that's blunt enough to say that so, that a take is bad or or that an idea is bad or whatever because like I mean you you're bringing this person on to put their name on something as well and you want them to be invested. You don't want them to just say, yeah, cool, great go you know a oh, good take next one um like he was he was he was hard on us which was great like i love that because again 
the songs are much better for it. It was, it's great. It was, it was, it was really fun to work with. Yeah. I am at least competitive enough to, if he plays something that I think is awesome, it's like, well, I've got to do better than that now. <laughs> so I'll, I've, got to, I've got to fucking do better than that. Because <laughs> I can't let him beat me. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> I'll show you. Yeah, up. exactly. <laughs> exactly. I can put 12 more notes in there than you can. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Look at this. Look at this. Why don't you go like this? He's one of the best human beings I've ever met in my life, and it's it's a it's a it's a it's a privilege to be able to not only work with him but be friends with him. It's really weird. Like when Luke and I sort of get together and work, we we don't just talk about the music. We we get we get done what we need to do in terms of the music and the direction of what we're trying to do. But so much more of it is on that really personal level. You know what I mean? And like over, over over a session, you know, two or three days or whatever it is that we're working together, you know, we just we have these really really deep discussions, you know, like about religion and the meaning of life and family and like parenting and all of these things, you know what I mean? And it's it's a really like wholesome experience, and I love it. I fucking love it. Oh yeah, the double, yeah. And maybe just be because you only ride, right? Just let, like, just be a little bit shankier on it. Not shank, but you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Here at the bottom, the never goes. Awesome, man. Brad's parts are super interesting. I think it's hard for a drummer in a 4-4 rock band to come up with really interesting parts and and man like I just listened to those drum tracks and it's like dude dude nailed it absolutely nailed it it was just it's such a pleasure to listen to there's it just a general like big rock modern drum sound that we kind of want and we knew from working previously with Matt and Luke that that they can deliver that so I wasn't too worried about that. I knew that the drum kit we used sounds amazing in the room and everything was going to be cool. We'd done Bravery already. That was, I guess that's part of this process. Is like Bravery was the first song. If it all sounds like that, then we're happy. Hey, just with the end of that one, um, I can't remember because I did... I think on the demo it might have been... Do you reckon one's better than the other or...? Yeah. For me, it's just whatever suits the song is what I'll try to do. Um, so for each song, it's a different motivation, but yeah, you just kind of, I don't ever try to overplay or anything. I just want the song to feel right and build in the right places, have the right accents. That's gonna sound yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. play pretty loud even in the studio you know try to play as if it's live the energy still comes across
Trey definitely put um, his project manager hat on with this. Like he 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 bunkered in with these demos really hard. Um, he tore these songs apart. Like he he worked harder on the writing process than I've ever seen him work ever. Uh, yeah, the original one that we had did that, right? Mm. I like the idea of having like an actual bar of build as well. Oh man, once I put like all the reverses and stuff in it, it'll, it's going to sound mint. Okay. I've got a vision. Go with you. Yeah, he's, he's got a vision. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I'm glad. I'm glad you're catching all of this today. There's some big decisions being made in that chair right there. <laughs> <laughs> Every other time we've done guitars, it's been, we're going to be in the main studio, we're going to put five amps and cabs in here, we're going to isolate them and 20 microphones and we're going to blend them all together and, you know, we, we run a completely digital rig live, so um, it's not beyond the realms of possibility to do it in the recording and, and luckily Luke's got um, endorsements through Fractal, so he's got the brand new X3 and like we shot it out against a couple of real amps, you know, we can put our amps in, take a power soak, set them up in the studio and record them, and then record the X3. And it's like, well, I can't tell the difference. And if I can't tell the difference, I'm gonna assume that other people can't tell the difference because I'm in the fucking room when we're doing it. <laughs> Tone days would take uh, like half a day. You're setting up different amps and yeah. you know, oh, that one doesn't sound great with this one, so that's going to be our lead tone. This is going to be our. And that's just, we don't have to do that anymore. Like you kind of trailed off in the, in the demo, like you're going. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of cool. Let's get close to what we want. Let's record the guitars and we can tweak it later. We can do all the things that we want to. It's like when we're in the mix, like, oh, that guitar needed a bit of this, this and that. Previously, that would have been a nightmare to try and re-record. Now we can just add on to it and, it, and it's, it's there. It's in the box with us. Um, and it means that we can record anyway. So I recorded some guitars at Luke's house in his small studio, some at, at Forey's house, because he's got a, a studio in his place. As opposed to paying $500 a day to be in a fancy studio, we can do it at a smaller place and it still sounds exactly the same. Like the guitars sound great on the record. I'm super happy with them. So, yeah, it just, it just kind of changed the way I think about what we actually need to do as opposed to what we can get away with. Um, and, and if it means that I can spend an extra couple of days putting finishing touches on the guitars and and just, I guess, having a bit more space to get it right as opposed to thinking, shit, I've got three days to do all these guitars. I've got to rush through them. We had a bit more time to breathe and a bit more time to play with it. And I think that ultimately transfers into the songs because we're going to have a bit more put more life and energy in them because we have to add new parts or play with parts or whatever. It's actually you're in the middle of positive and negative. So like that's kind of what that lyric of as the walls around you break blown apart by a light grenade is, mm. is that it, you find yourself in this position of you've you've been putting yourself down forever and finally there's a glimmer of hope. Yeah. But you're torn, you're in the middle. Like it's yep. that's that's it. Glimmer um, of hope, by the way. The challenge for me really was sinking my heart and soul into these lyrics and, and really giving people something to think about and, and hopefully 
hopefully be able to draw something from their own experience out of those words as well. Um, but that really was it, trying to put, trying to put my soul on paper um, and, and into the words. Um, that was the big challenge for me. There you go. But that darkness is not the word. Um, right. So it'd be Dark like a... Darkness in it, let's go. <laughs> we had a deadline. We had the dates booked and about four of the... I'm, actually, I'll say, I'll say openly, most of the songs didn't have completed lyrics. You know, like I write what I refer to as scratch lyrics um, before with a demo, just like first things that come out and that's your melody and then write the lyrics on top of that. So I, I work backwards and the long way around because here I am with a melody in my mind that I've got to make syllables fit and I've got to make the syllables make sense and create a narrative and like create a story. It's, the, it's horrible, it's, it's painstaking. So that definitely was a challenge, but I wanted to take this seriously and really put everything that I possibly could into it. So I, I painstakingly sat in my darkened garage um, and, just, and just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And, and the guys were really, really helpful with it as well. They told me what they didn't like and, and, and what they did like. Discord. I had Discord, I know, I, I love it so much, I love that word. Between Discord, but it's like a weird word like that though. Because it worked really well with the old one that I had. Um, mm. Yeah, I just love that word because it's real, like it brings everything together. But, um, but it's just, it's a weird one in that. Between Discord and all, yeah, it's just too, yeah. I have real yeah. trouble with lyrics. Like I'm, uh, I fell into singing. Um, I'm not. I, I'm not a. I, w I don't. I still don't call myself a singer. It's. It's like I sing for these four walls. But like I don't. Like I, I started playing guitar in school bands and and then when when it, our singer left, I was like, oh, okay, why? Well, I'll, I'll do it then. And it just turned out. It just happened. And. And because of that, like I'd never really focused on vocals. I'm, I'm horrible at lyrics. I'm horrible at remembering lyrics. Like if we if we play a cover at a gig, the sheet's in front of me because I can't. Uh, there's no retention. You know, like the guys make fun of me all the time because I just don't know the lyrics to any songs at all because I'm not listening to them. I'm not a singer. I, I listen to every other part of the song, but not the vocals. And um, so yeah, when it comes to lyrics, it's a it's struggle street for me um, because I don't know what to write about. You know, I, I don't consider myself a, a poet or a or a, a writer. You know, it's 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 this weird entity where I sit down with a pad of paper and I just go, what now? Like like I don't know what to do. I think the the juxtaposition of of the previous line, blown apart by a light grenade as well. Like of just the like it actually has light and shade in the lyrical content mm. as well. Um, Between Havoc and Hope. The canned portion of it is nice. The lyrical secrts. Browsing thesaurus.com. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm trying to avoid using the word chaos because yeah. the song's not going to be called chaos. In the end oh of it. really? Uh, well, apparently, well, great. Great thinks that there's too many songs out there called chaos. So I mean, I'm not. I'm not. But I'm in the same. Uh, but I'm tempted to use calamity just just for the Zelda thing because um, oh, yeah. it kind of means the same thing. But at the moment, it's just it'll just be chaos. I reckon it's chaos is you have to call it chaos. Yeah. Strike! Oh, it's such a violent regression. Warm them pipes! Let's see where we go. Strung out, I'm losing track of my direction. Struck out, it's such a violent regression. I'm very uh, blessed to have been surrounded by lovely, lovely, amazing people in my life and and I'm very close with my family and very close with my friends and I, and I grew up in a really small town where you have to be close with everyone. Um, so the good and the bad obviously show themselves a lot in those kinds of scenarios and it's given me a lot to, to take from. Black out, something's coming loose, your apathy is tightening the noose, so hey, yo, systematic user, this is not a future.
to do yeah. the? Do you want to do those guys? Yeah. We're in the. You're in the middle of it. You're in the middle of it. It's not a future. It's not a future. Because I feel like that. Strum out. Is like a screen, and then that comes in over the top. Yeah. Okay. You like two parts? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, oh, you're in the middle of it. Oh, you're in the middle of it. Yeah. Oh, it's not a future. Okay. Strum. Oh, you're in the middle of it. Okay, cool. Okay. You're in the middle of it. You're in the middle of it. It's not a future. It's not a future. So say something we know. Self-deprecation is all we own. As the walls around you break. I never write about any one specifically, um, and if it is, it's a very, very, very alternate universe of that person um, and uh, and of myself. Particularly with these songs, it's it's ended up being very sad and and not not depressing. It's always everything that I write about is always the flip side of if you're if you're down, there's always an up. And, and that's more so than ever with this album. Like it's, every song is, is, has that entity. Self-deprecation is all we own. Let the walls around you break, blown apart by a light grenade. I felt like the second half wasn't as intense as the first half. Okay. Should we split it? Maybe. Yep. Okay. Yes. Let's, let's let's split it, shall we? Yep. First two lines. Yep. Just so we inject every bit of power into every cool. facet of it. <clears throat> Should we do it word by word? <laughs> <laughs> my my grandmother, who is who was a, a incredible influence on my music, it, it, she passed a couple of years ago now. And, and that was a big factor with me with this album. She was such a... It is crazy, that, that woman. She's crazy. She was a crazy person. But in the, in the best possible way. Like, she was... Um, like, when I was first getting into music, um, uh, she was so excited and so passionate about it that she like just invested in me and I don't mean just money I mean like time like just always calling me about music asking me about music you know just like she bought a banjo um, so that she could pretend to write a song about a duck to help me write a song like it's the most ridiculous the ridiculous things right just like and then and then when these four walls happened um, our very first EP show she flew over from Australia and is my grandma she would have been 60 at the time probably something like that in the middle of the pit right just just losing her mind just in the pit right and she's just she was just always there and um and always like whenever an album was coming out or a single was coming out or anything like that i've got an email waiting for me i've got a i've got a, I've got a phone call like ah, freaking out you know just like she was our number one fan without a doubt and and she was my number one fan and it was it was tough writing this album and knowing that she wasn't going to be there to to hear it there was the this light, this absolute light um, that went out, you know, and and it didn't seem fair to me um, at all, uh, and and it, it was it was really it was a heartbreaking moment, uh, for obviously like clearly obviously a heartbreaking moment, and, and everyone goes through it, but um, there was this element of fairness that came into play for me, and and that was what a lot of the stuffs kind of branched from. So um, there's a couple songs that are very much inspired by her um, uh, for good and bad but purely in story sake you know nothing nothing directly personal yeah yeah no she's she's my hero is uh, yeah
was a suggestion by Luke, but we, I mean, I've been aware of him forever. He's, he's just one of the best piano players I've ever seen, um, let alone heard. Like I've seen him, uh, thankfully, hanging around with Matt. Uh, I've, I've seen him in the studio playing and he'll just, he'll just walk in and, and play the part and see you later. You know, it's just, it's crazy how, how efficient and, and lovely a human he is. I've never tried playing it, I've just been listening to it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. For sure. Cool. And I don't mind doing that because it's grandiose, like the more layers, yeah. it's just going to feel big. You yeah. Know? In particular, Nothing Land, that's different to all of our other songs, uh, quite different. And we wanted to treat it differently because we felt like it deserved to have uh, something more. That sounds good. Whatever you did then sounded Unreal. musically right. Yeah. Mm. So there's, there, that happens three times, that little section. Yeah, and then the second time it goes straight into that, like it gets into a heavy, heavy yeah. part. Yeah. 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 Around maybe like a... yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like a sort of ghost when thing. Luke suggested we go all in or don't go at all, uh, I, I was very much behind that. Uh, so Luke suggested that we we get Ian to play the grand piano uh, and, and actually book it out and do it properly. And, um, and that was an experience unto itself, really sitting there. For me, as a, as a songwriter, that's the first time, I've heard my songs come to life, but I, it's the first time I've ever written a part and heard someone proficient perform it on a freaking seven foot piano in a, in a concert hall. Like it was mind blowing, honestly, I was just, amazed that what I had written on a computer was coming to actual life in front of my eyes. It was, it was amazing. We could have done since. We could have just used plugins on Pro Tools and, and made it sound 80% of what it does now. But like, we had the time, we had a bit of money to do it, and and why not? Like, when we did Downfalls and Empire, we had a whole choir in the studio with us, and we could have just done that ourselves and made some gang vocals. But having like 20 different voices in there made it sound that much cooler. So if we could go the extra mile to make something sound cooler, absolutely we'll do it. And I think Nothing Land's a really good example. And same with Ian, again, we, it's just keys. It's just keys. We could have easily done it with Pro Tools, but no, let's go rent out a grand piano in a giant hall <laughs> and get one of the greatest musicians in Australia to record ding, ding, ding. Yeah. <laughs> It's just the magic of when you kind of strike it at the same time and it's not too flammed. Yeah, it's just yeah, come. It's just coming into that rhythm like cold. Is just a bit. It's a bit. Yeah. I'll give you an extra bar. You could probably play into it if you want. I'll just. To. I'll try this. I'll, tr yeah. I'll try doing. I'll just get a rhythm going. He's a very, very incredibly well-trained musician and it shows because he came in for half a day and, and breathed life into a song that is there forever now. Like, and it's just better than it ever could have been because of that.
think about it like Barty can push it up in the mix, but it's quite delicate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You don't get the the human feel, the feel like someone's actually fucking playing this thing, and that, that was super important to that track because of what that song is and what it represents, and you know how, the journey that that song itself has been on. It deserved the effort. It deserved us to put more time and money into this thing, and that's what we did. I think we've got a few in here that are going to be really good live. Yeah, especially with the new ones. Uh, like we've already been playing Bravery and Far Away for a, a little while. The ones we haven't played, it's like Chaos. That we're looking forward to trying that out live and seeing how that goes. We think it's going to be really good. I guess you could call it the opener of the album, but the first real song is a song called Chaos, and we've been jamming that one in the room for the last last couple of weeks. And yeah, I cannot wait to bring that one live. Like that's uh, that's that's just such a heavy hitter. It's I, I can't wait. Yeah, Chaos. Like that's that for me. That's the standout song of the album. That just goes. Yep, that's a, that's a these four walls gig song. Yeah. Um, there's a song that will not probably, the way that it's recorded won't be the way that we play it live, but it's a song called Before I'm Gone, which was the last song written for the album. And honestly, that's one of the, the best songs I've ever heard in my life. So even though I won't be playing on it, I didn't play on it on the album and I won't be playing it tonight, I'm, I can't wait to just 
get in the crowd and just watch him do that. And like, I don't, I, I do this thing like the fans that come to a lot of our shows will know. Any time I can get off the stage and get into the pit, that's what I do. I, I fucking love it. It's like so many people don't get to see their own band play, you know. And it's just going to be very intimate between the crowd and myself. It's it's going to be really cool. And help me. Thank you guys so much. Um, there's that song, there's another song called White Lies, which is really, really fun. Um, it's just a good bouncy track, uh, and that's, that's, that's really cool to bring out. Yeah, White Lies is another one that's it's got like really good energy. And then um, even something like Rock Bottom, which is very different and kind of um, a lot more feel in it. It's quite different to what we've done. Yeah, I think Rock Bottom is going to be a fun one to play. That was a song that I was very much opposed to being on the record originally. Um, I didn't get it. Uh, Steve had pretty much written the whole thing as a blueprint, vocals and that. And I just, I don't know, for some reason I just wasn't into it, didn't get it. And then when Luke got involved and we started fleshing out and, and adding a lot of guitars into it and it became a bit more of a rock song because it was quite a jammy blues thing originally and, and it became the song that it is now. And like knowing the story behind it, like knowing what it means to Steve is a very personal song. I think that's something that we've always had success with and like being very honest and, and quite open with what we've done. You know, we had a lot of songs in the other records that are very personal and, and that we've always known that those are the songs that people can relate to. And I think Rock Bottom's gonna be the track on this record that does it. And because of that, they're the best songs to play live because people want to hear that song because it means something to them. And you know, they'll sing along, they'll get into it and that sort of thing. Rizzy, what's going on? The we've got now three albums worth of stuff to, to rotate through and yeah, it changes. Sometimes we'll go all the way back to old stuff and we never get tired of it that way. It's always nice to mix it up and play something a bit different. You know, we want to follow it up with tours and whatever else we can. Um, you know, that's, that's what we enjoy doing is playing live. We've got a rough release plan. As soon as that album hits the ground, the plan is go and play some shows. What we want to spend the next year doing is, is just getting out there and seeing as much of the country as we can. And for us at the moment to be put in front of audiences, the best way of doing that is to is to be supporting other bands. Like we just came off the road with the Butterfly Effect and man, that was just awesome. Just seeing a top tier tour for Australia um, and, and being on the supporting end and new new audiences every night. And that went really well for us. It was, it was great. We had such a good time and met so many amazing people. Um, so we'd love to focus on, on doing a bit more of that. Uh, we'd love to try and, and, and get on board with the festival scene in Australia. I think we've made a lot of excuses for not doing stuff as, as a live band. It's like, well, we've just released a single. Yeah, but it's just a single. We don't need to go tour on it. It's like, no, fuck it, we're doing a record. This is a whole record. This is a big deal. Because like, and, and I, I asked in an interview a couple weeks ago, um, to name my favourite Australian album releases this year, I couldn't. A bit embarrassing because it was a live phone, <laughs> a live conversation. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't, you know, not a lot of bands are releasing records anymore. So we have to make an event out of this because this is a big deal. And, and, you know, we've been doing this for over 12, 13 years now and we've only released two records. So obviously these things don't come around all the time. So we've just got to make the most of it, you know, put some fucking effort behind the marketing, put some effort into getting it out to people's ears and then tour it, just hit the road and then actually play some shows and then start to, to platform off this thing. I think that's, that's all we can do now.
we love playing shows. Like the four of us walk on a stage and that's what it's all about. It's just being able to turn around and see everyone. Just, you know, turn around and see Brad and just be like, give him this weird face when I've played the wrong chord or that kind of thing. Or look over at Elliot when I've screwed up a vocal and he's singing a harmony he's left on his own and I just see him glare at me. It's just like, it's the best feeling in the world, you know? So that's, so that's what we do it for. Uh, we we want to put this album into the hands of the people that, that made it happen. And, and let them learn the lyrics and then get them to come to as many shows as they possibly can and sing them back to us. That's, that's the big one.